Welcome to creating an autonomous vehicle ecosystem in Virginia. I am John Gustavo Blair, Assistant Director for National Business Investment at the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority, also known as FCEDA. I'm excited to host this event on behalf of the FCEDA in partnership with the Fairfax County Department of Economic Initiatives. We have an exciting lineup of speakers and panelists as part of the program today. It is my pleasure to introduce Etta Nahapetian from the Fairfax County Department of Economic Initiatives to provide welcome remarks. Etta? Yes, thanks so much, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Etta Nahapetian, the Manager of Smart Community Innovation and Strategy at the Fairfax County Department of Economic Initiatives. And I am very happy to be here to talk today um, on creating an autonomous vehicle ecosystem here in Fairfax and in the Commonwealth. I remember as a kid, watching Star Trek, uh, being a Star Trek fan, actually, I'm still a huge Star Trek fan. And I remember watching Jean-Luc Picard go on his communicator. And I remember watching the Jetsons and the flying cars. And, um, and here, here we are, we're trying to make some of those childhood cartoons a reality here in Fairfax and with our Department of Economic Initiatives. Um, DEI was created about three years ago to foster innovation to encourage entrepreneurship, and also to shepherd groundbreaking public-private partnerships. You may have heard of one of the PPAs that our staff are working on, Fairfax Peak, which is in South County of Fairfax. Um, if, if, if all goes according to plan, you will be able to ski down in Lorton in about five years. So, you know, for our department, you won't always see our name and lights, but um, if you read the end of the credits, you'll often see our name at the bottom, and we, all, we often play a really important role in, in many of, of these groundbreaking things that we're doing here in Fairfax. So my job is to look at innovation and see how we can apply and find opportunities to implement some innovative um, technologies and to help make the lives of our residents better here in Fairfax. And I work with a group of really amazing folks, both within the county and in the community, um, we like to say we put the smart in cities. I know it's kind of corny, but it's true. Um, and our intention is to have, find new approaches for technology and how we can make our lives better. So some examples um, of some of the recent things that we've done. We partnered with Smart City Works and the Center for Innovative Technology just a few months ago in April. We had a innovation challenge, what we call a pitch and pilot on bike and pedestrian safety. Um, some of you may realize that there have been, uh, unfortunately, increase in traffic fatalities um, for bike and bike, bicyclists and pedestrians over the past 10 years. And that has only been exacerbated uh, with the pandemic because as speeds have slowed down, I mean, as speeds, as traffic has gone down, speeds have increased, which is, and more people have been on the streets. So we did a challenge to, to and we're working with, a, with a, a startup company out in California that won the challenge to work on a pilot project um, using technology to in, increase bike and ped safety. We also partnered, um, we launched in January in partnership with a month long challenge in January with Smart City Works, Refraction, an organization called Girls in Tech, Virginia Tech, and also the universities at Shetty Grove um, where we had 49 companies pitching over a month um, and we had winning solutions in the public safety space and infrastructure. And actually one of the companies that pitched to us that was one of the winners is going to be in one of the panels later on today. So we're excited here to showcase for you um, and uh, to share with you our showcase innovation project, Relay. Uh, we've launched many pilot projects, but um, this one is our most ambitious and it really launched our direction in the smart city space. So, you know, this really is a team sport and so many of our team members are here on our panels today. And I wanna thank you, all of you, all the speakers and partners to help that have helped make this event a reality. So um, I'll send it back to you, John, thank you. Thank you, Atta. Uh, next up on the agenda is Alex Imes, Executive Vice President of the FCDA. He'll be giving opening remarks about our organization and how we are supporting emerging technologies such as autonomous systems. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Himes, and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. We're so pleased to be putting on this event in partnership with the Fairfax County government. 
The FCDA's mission is to promote and support businesses in Fairfax County, as well as conduct outreach to companies across the U.S. and around the world. We're connected to the business community with a network of overseas offices and an office in California. We have not been traveling for in-person visits during the pandemic, but we have traveled the world virtually through events like this one today. This event enables us to highlight the exciting developments here in Fairfax County and illustrate how we support the growth of an innovation economy. Fairfax County is a leader in emerging technologies, including ground autonomous systems. As you'll see today, we have an environment where collaboration brings exciting projects to life. The FCED has an active role in the ecosystem that you'll get a glimpse of this afternoon. It includes Fairfax County government, the Department of Economic Initiatives, and you just heard from ETA, the Department of Transportation, and the Commonwealth government, including its Department of Transportation and the Department of Rail and Public Transit. The ecosystem also includes businesses and institutions of higher learning. Companies like Dominion Energy have taken an active role in partnership with us on the Relay Autonomous Electric Shuttle, which you'll be hearing more on later. And Fairfax County is a hotbed for innovation with research centers like Virginia Tech's Transportation Institute. We also frequently lend our support to initiatives like the Smart City Challenge, which helps Fairfax County connect to emerging tech companies uh, in and around our area. Another innovative program at the FCD I want to let you know about is our Talent Initiative, which has been especially valuable to our companies during this pandemic. Use the workinnorthernvirginia.com website as a foundation where more than 100,000 job openings are posted. Our Talent Initiative team connects businesses to resources to attract, retain, and retrain skilled tech talent in Northern Virginia. Thank you again for joining us today to learn about technology that can make the dream of autonomy a reality and how Fairfax County, the Commonwealth of Virginia, research institutions such as Virginia Tech and other partners are working together on this journey. Back to you, John. Thank you, Alex. And now, Tracy Tynan, director of the Virginia Unmanned Systems Center at the Center for Innovative Technology, has some prepared remarks on autonomy in Fairfax County. Hi, I'm Tracy Tynan, and I am the director of the Virginia Unmanned Systems Center at CIT, which is the Center for Innovative Technology and is located right here in Fairfax County. I appreciate the opportunity to participate once again with the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority in a program that is meant to highlight the benefits of autonomous vehicles industry and describe really how the county has supported the advancement of these technologies. So earlier this year, FCEDA hosted an online symposium that focused on the use of autonomous aerial systems, or UAVs. This program today, however, is going to focus on the use of autonomous or unmanned ground vehicles and really show how Fairfax County has become a national leader in the development and implementation of unmanned vehicle systems. For example, Relay is an autonomous shuttle developed by Fairfax County that operates and carries commuters between the Dunloring Metro Rail Station and the Mosaic Shopping District. Additionally, there's a project in Reston where we utilize a autonomous taxi that moves people from the remote parking to the office complex itself. Uh, these projects sort of demonstrate the useful role for unmanned systems to carry passengers along the last mile of public transportation network. And of course, that segment is critical to your journey, but it's also oftentimes the most difficult one to build. Another example of the benefits of autonomous vehicle systems can be seen at George Mason University. GMU has personal delivery devices they kind of look like small robots that scurry around on the sidewalks and carry supplies and food to very busy faculty and students who are always on the go. And the Virginia Automated Corridor System that covers more than 70 miles of interstate and roadways in Northern Virginia, including much of it in Fairfax County. And they're providing manufacturers and suppliers of these automated vehicle systems with the real world environments needed prior to operating their vehicles on our public roadways. These initiatives in Fairfax County are encouraging other communities in Virginia and also across America to adopt autonomous vehicles to make their transportation systems more efficient, both operationally 
and economically while enhancing their safety. As you're well aware, Fairfax County is a very significant business center which has attracted numerous regional, national, and international companies to put their headquarters in our area. This vast and energetic urban community makes it a prime location to integrate autonomous vehicle systems to advance the transportation network quickly and safely, moving people from place to place. At today's symposium, you'll become familiar with the opportunities in autonomous vehicle systems that Fairfax County has to offer. CIT is pleased to collaborate with FCEDA, as well as the Virginia Department of Transportation, the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute, and numerous Virginia businesses to further develop this technology and this emerging industry. So it's great to be with you today, and I really look forward to hearing from our panelists and appreciate your attention so much. Thank you. So you can see there's a great deal of activity in the unmanned systems sector here in Fairfax County. This event will have something for everyone who is attending today, from those who are experts on what is going on in Northern Virginia to those who are just getting started on learning about autonomous systems in Fairfax County. Let's get to our first panel, Sensing, Perception, and the Connected Corridor. We'll be focusing on how technology is being deployed to safely enable vehicles to function in even the most complicated scenarios. It is my pleasure to introduce Jackie Beckwith of the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International, who will moderate the panel. Jackie? Sure, hi everyone. Good afternoon and thank you, John, and Fairfax County EDA. I am thrilled to be here. I'm really excited for a robust discussion around what sensing and perception mean in the context of autonomous vehicles and then how those concepts are applied to work towards connected corridors, which we've mentioned a little bit so far. So let's go ahead and introduce our fantastic panel. We've got some great folks for everybody. Uh, first up, we've got Mike Molenauer, the director of the Division of Technology Implementation at VTTI. Mike, thanks for being here. Uh, we've also got Dave Tokic, who is the Vice President of Marketing and Strategic Partnerships at Algolux. They are a technology company, and so he uh, can speak towards what exactly sensing and perception mean from a tech angle. We've got Kathy McGee, Director of Research and Innovation uh, at the Virginia Transportation Research Council. She is also an advisor to Virginia Department of Transportation Secretary Valentine. Uh, so she is well embedded in the Virginia state government and has a lot to offer. And then finally, we've got Paul Perone, the founder and CEO of Perone Robotics. Uh, and they are kind of inserting this AV technology into a lot of different contexts, which we'll talk about. So with that, uh, let's go ahead. And I would love it, Dave, if you could kind of explain to folks what exactly sensing and perception mean, and perhaps even use an analogy of, you know, folks' five senses uh, in terms of seeing, hearing, touching. So Dave, I'll, I'll toss it off to you. Great, thanks Jackie for the warm intro for us and uh, happy to be here with the panel. Um, so to get a, give a little bit of background, Algolux is a, um, a world recognized um, provide, software provider of computer vision technologies. And so we deal with sensing and perception very directly for cars and autonomous vehicles and, and robotics, et cetera. So if we think about sensing, people understand seeing and, and hearing and touch, et cetera. And so for enabling an autonomous vehicle or, or even newer generation of, car, of cars that are coming out with more automated functionality, um, those vehicles need to first sense, which is to be able to take in information um, such as we're seeing a, you know, a car or a pedestrian or you know, the mailbox when we gotta go get our mail uh, and we know it's a certain distance away and um, you know, or if there's something in the road, we know to go around it. Uh, vehicles need to do the same thing, uh, especially with more um, higher levels of autonomy for those vehicles. And so that's primarily done through uh, a number of different sensors. Um, most people are familiar with cameras in cars, especially if you have like a backup camera that you've seen before. Um, so cameras are a very common, <clears throat> excuse me, common sensor for um, autonomous vehicles. And also radar and LIDAR. Um, LIDAR is a pretty uh, hot topic these days. Probably many people have been hearing about it or seeing those either spinning things sitting on top of autonomous vehicles or the more compact versions like on the relay shuttle. Um, and LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. 
Um, radar, we kind of know what that does, sending out some signals and um, getting a, a return on that to see what's out there. And, and LiDAR does sort of the same thing with light. Um, and then cameras allow us to have more contextual understanding of the environment. Like, is that a vehicle or is that a, you know, a, a pedestrian? Uh, that's a little more difficult to do with radar and LiDAR. But those are the sensors that these vehicles use and then there needs to be the perception piece of it, which is really getting that understanding. Um, we do that sort of instinctually. I'm walking down a path and there's a, um, um, a puppy in, or a dog in front of me that I want to pet. Oh, I know it's over here and, or I want to walk around it if uh, that's not my thing. Uh, whereas with a, a vehicle, it needs to take the sensor information and through some pretty sophisticated algorithms understand what that data is. And um, really it's just a stream of ones and zeros, kind of this digital information that's coming that these algorithms are trained or learned to understand what that means, those patterns to then determine um, what is the, or in the surrounding and then ultimately from a control perspective, how do I respond to that? And that perception today is, in, is typically done with what, um, through AI, through artificial intelligence, but a certain type, um, which is deep learning in many cases, uh, there's many kinds of AI, but deep learning is the one common one used for perception, which is really leveraging a, a large um, set of data that represents typical scenarios and using that data to train the algorithm to understand those bits that come in, the, the, the information that comes in, and then create an understanding of the environment. And then once that understanding is there, then that's how the vehicle will respond, uh, be act on to respond appropriately. So hopefully that gives a good kind of background on the sensor suite, if you will, that's being used by vehicles, as well as the perception approach to really understand the surroundings in order to act on it. It was great, Dave, and I think that terminology, especially in this field, is so important to kind of come to an agreement on and make sure that folks kind of understand, oh, okay, all these things I do as a human very instinctually, but, you know, when we're talking about a machine, that those decisions need to be replicated somehow, which is the difficult part. So, and frankly, Paul, that kind of leads me straight to you. I mean, Corona Robotics does it all. You guys have bots, you have shuttles, you have trucks. So, um, when you use these sensors, does it depend on the environment in which the vehicles will be operating? How do you determine what each uh, kind of operational domain or, or ODD needs from sensors to operate safely? Yeah, thank you, Jackie, and, and we're proud to be here. We've been a Virginia-based um, uh, autonomous vehicle company for quite a while, dating back to the uh, first DARPA Grand Challenge in the uh, 2005, the, the LiDAR sensors were $150,000. We couldn't afford one. Um, we went for a lower cost model, but I learned going from that, that was a, a desert race to a to 2007, right? There was these, uh, um, uh, it was the urban challenge. And so now the sensors were half the price, and but it was a different type of vehicle platform. So really early on, we learned about um, the importance of being a vehicle agnostic and hardware agnostic because the pace of technology is going to change very rapidly with sensors um, across environments. Now those same LIDARs are $1,000 or $4,000, right? So, um, and we came uh, as recently from 2016 working with auto manufacturers for higher speed applications, 55, 65 miles an hour, dense urban populations to now these um, these more manageable controlled sort of environments like autonomous shuttles where we're going 25, 35, but with different types of vehicles. And, and it's important for us to, as we've learned to, to be able to choose the right vehicle for the environment, for the job. So in some cases, we've got a, a neighborhood electric vehicle. We've also got a, um, a large uh, all electric ADA compliant transit van, for example, two completely different form factors of vehicles Based, that are driven by the operational design domain and environment in which they operate. Some have to, you know, be roadworthy, you know, FMVSS compliant vehicles. Others um, uh, might might not have to be that if they're in controlled environments. Like for example, we're working with um, pulling big semi trailers around a distribution yard with these yard trucks, right? 
And, um, but it was very important for us to be able to, to make this an economical venture to apply very similar technology, but still be kind of um, agnostic as to the different types of sensor technology, to be able to pull in the right sensors for the job, to be able to handle traveling, you know, 35, 55 miles an hour in one application or a little slower in another, and then pick the right sensors. Um, so um, so uh, it's still important as, um, Dave mentioned to have this diversity of sensors like LIDAR, radar, camera. We also bring in ultrasonics or, or thermal imaging sensors and, and things of that nature, depending on the, the job. But, um, but it's, it becomes uh, you know, important to have that flexibility um, for the different environments um, and, uh, and for the speed of application, the size of the vehicle and how many sensors you need around the vehicle. And, uh, and then it also becomes important to be able to swap to different sensors because um, it's not like the old days where, you, you, you know, you might buy a bus in a transit application and it's, you know, you'll be guaranteed that bus is, is or, or that vehicle um, will be in service for 10 to 15 years. In this case, 10 to 15 years will be, um, you know, you'll go through four or five iterations of, of LIDAR sensors, right? So the ability to in a modular fashion switch between these different sensors is very important for these applications and it's something that we've you know had to had to manage and and that we've certainly encountered in being able to support these types of projects um, uh, as they scale and as they evolve with uh, with customers thanks paul yeah i i think that um a lot of folks when they think about the application of autonomous vehicles you probably think of the relay project that i know will be talked about later on but i think your example of you know warehouse yard trucks is fascinating a very controlled environment and still certainly positively affects communities and constituents and, and businesses as well so um on that note kathy especially with your with your virginia dot experience it'd be great to kind of hear from you um and ex maybe expand upon the, the point that etta made earlier about how all of this can, can improve people's lives. I mean, the technology is really exciting. Those of us in industry love seeing the next development, but how does it actually affect people? And, and what does the state hope to get in increasing the application safely of this technology? Thanks so much, Jackie. That, that's a great lead in for me because I, you know, I try to stress whenever I have the opportunity to participate in a panel like this, that for an organization like VDOT, um, all of this technology is great, but only if we can uh, leverage it to help us meet our, our mission uh, of providing safe mobility um, for, for travelers in the Commonwealth. And, and so it all goes back to that statistic that we hear all too often that, you know, more than 90% of crashes can be attributed to driver error. And so for us, it's about utilizing this technology uh, to overcome that challenge. Um, one of the best things about technology is that it doesn't get distracted uh, and driver distraction has become such a huge problem for us. So we're looking to, to the technology to really help us um, put safety first and begin to drive down those um, injury and, and fatality numbers that unfortunately continue to climb. It's, it's interesting for me to hear all this discussion about sensing and, and sensors, uh, because for, for me, I'm on the other side of it, right? And I'm, I, I would love to be able to use the data that these vehicles are collecting through these very uh, uh, high-tech sensors to help me operate the transportation system more effectively. So that means connectivity. And that means that um, that the vehicle is talking to the infrastructure and the infrastructure is talking to the vehicle. Uh, we did that with the relay deployment. Um, we were able to provide signal timing information um, to relay uh, through, the, through the use of, of dedicated short range communications. And obviously the future of that particular technology is up in the air right now. But I think there's lot, a lot to be gained um, by allowing that at that connectivity between vehicles and the infrastructure. Um, but you have to have two-way communications and we have to find a way to do that. Um, one of the areas that we believe connectivity can really be helpful, not only for us as, as infrastructure owner operators, but also for, for these vehicles is in work zones because those tend to be very dynamic situations and situations where um, perhaps the sensors 
uh, are more likely to encounter things they can't decipher or they're not used to. And certainly uh, mapping that's been done ahead of time may not be as useful as it is in, in more typical conditions. So we're doing a lot of work, uh, particularly with VTTI and Mike Mullenhauer, who, you'll, who, who will be speaking next, uh, to, to figure out how these vehicles can operate safely in these dynamic uh, conditions that we find in work zones. So I'm really excited about sensors, not only uh, on these vehicles, but also providing information to the vehicles um, directly from the infrastructure to complement the sensor suites on those vehicles. And I think all of that together will help us deliver a, a safe and reliable transportation system. And safety really is a theme, I think, that kind of knits everybody together, both the technology providers, the companies, the regulators, state officials, and public, certainly. We all, the, the, the goal of, of autonomy in general is to make our world a safer place. Um, and so, Mike, uh, Kathy gave a perfect segue. So we've got folks like Dave and Paul and their companies creating this technology, making these really exciting advances. Kathy and her team and other state governments look at these new developments and say, hey, how can we implement this to make our constituents' lives better? And then as she referenced, you know, you and the Virginia Tech team um, love some state pride there. So I'm glad, I'm glad Virginia Tech is represented and uh, the, the intellect you all have on your team is, is top notch, but I know I'm preaching to the choir. So um, you all then, you know, support Kathy and her team and say, okay, let's, you know, test this stuff. And I know you all are also working on some sort of connected corridor thing, which is part of our panel. So if you could talk about kind of what the connected corridor project is, and then also how you do road test these new developments to make sure that folks driving on the highway and, and elsewhere are, are safe. Sure. Uh, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll start with the Virginia Connected Corridor. That's been a collaborative project that we've worked on uh, with VDOT since, geez, all the way back to 2014 now. So been at it a while. Um, and the goal there, or the mission there is really to take some of these early stage uh, technologies, things like the dedicated short range communications um, and tie them into existing VDOT systems and see what types of advantages we can get from deploying the technology. And it's not really just about putting radios on the road. It's also about developing the underlying applications that can take the data from these systems, turn it, turn it into something meaningful that a driver or an automated vehicle can consume, and then getting it back out um, from the infrastructure to the vehicle uh, to be able to, uh, to operate more safely or more efficiently in the environment. So some examples of that are, you know, we talked about work zones as being a challenge for automated vehicles. Um, that is definitely true. They have sensors on board that can detect things like cones and signs to understand where they are. But we believe that it's much safer if you can provide the vehicle with a digital definition of what that work zone is prior to when it arrives in the area so that it can either choose to route itself around uh, that work zone if it, can't if, if it thinks its capabilities aren't able to handle it or uh, potentially it can just prepare itself to be ready for the types of hazards that we see in a work zone, things like queues that have been developing or potentially trucks that are entering or leaving the roadway. Those things can all be um, challenging as well. So we developed a, an application, it's called the Work Zone Builder. It's a tablet-based application that uh, those who are designing work zones can build the work zone itself. They can publish the data into the VDOT system and then an AV or a connected vehicle running through the environment can consume that information and then get a much better understanding of what is there and when it's active. And so those types of technologies, I think, can really expand the digital horizon for that vehicle so that it has a better understanding of what it's about to face. I heard talk, uh, Paul talk about uh, the job, right, the driving job uh, before. And, and the technical term we use for that is kind of like the operational design domain, right? This is what the particular automated vehicle has been designed uh, to be able to handle in terms of the environment that it's driving to through. So like the roadways, the speeds, uh, the weather conditions uh, and those types of things. And so, uh, you know, we're also working to, to develop systems to help provide more advanced information to automated vehicles so that they understand the um, types of um, operational design domain conditions that they're, they're about to experience. Um, from, from the perspective of the relay project, you know, our role in that project was really to um, monitor the safety of that operation. And so we installed cameras. Uh, in addition to the existing cameras that are on that vehicle, we added more um, that gave us 360 degree coverage. And we monitor, I guess, um, every minute of every drive and record the video 
And um, we look for, or we, we harvest that, that video from the vehicle on a regular basis. We look for interesting events, and that might be deceleration events, uh, disengagements when the system has to do a, an emergency stop for whatever reason, or it might be um, other things that we're just recognizing uh, within the scene. So from that, we uh, mine these interesting events, and then we provide feedback to the team about where or under what conditions the vehicle is operating safely or where it might be challenged. And we found, I guess I've, I, I was somewhat surprised by you know, the aggressiveness of the drivers in the area can be a real challenge for vehicles, uh, automated vehicles. And so, um, you know, I, I think uh, it's a great test environment. I think it was probably one of the first and most challenging environments for particularly for the vehicle type that we were working with. And so um, it's uh, allowed us to learn a lot about uh, what could be done to number one, improve uh, that vehicle capability, but also what we can do on the infrastructure side to better support the operation. That's fantastic. Thank you, Mike. Um, and yes, uh, aggressive driving is unfortunately rampant here um, in Northern Virginia. I know we're right up against the time, but I'd love to just do a quick kind of popcorn style question to all the panelists. Um, understanding that this, the whole goal of this event is to educate folks and to, and to kind of lower the barriers to this technology. Is there one thing that, you know, if you had to convey to folks a myth or something that was misunderstood, what would it be? Um, and give like a quick 10 second example. So Dave, I'll start with you. What is one thing you wish folks knew or, or didn't believe about AV? Um, well, I think there's a lot of, I'll be um, provocative here. There's a lot of information coming from Tesla about, hey, we've got self-driving vehicles here. Um, that is um, self-driving with a human operator. Um, so I would say the um, key challenge is around robustness, which means ability to operate in many different environments, low light, bad weather, things of that nature, construction zones, et cetera. This is, um, I would say, something that is going to take time for the industry as a whole to get their hands wrapped around, something Algolux is focused on, but it is a big technical challenge. And so it's gonna take some time to get through that. So I would say um, one thing to take away is, um, uh, you know, there's not gonna be self-driving cars in your driveway like next year. Um, but the work that uh, the team's been doing with Relay is really kind of setting the stage for a future that we see of new mobility. Good, Paul, hop over to you. Sure, um, this may be controversial, but I will say that um, the path to certification and safety, I, I do not think is through heavy reliance on deep learning and, neur and neural networks and artificial intelligence. I think that's a probabilistic way that can't be deterministically proven to be safe. And it's a, there's, so there's a lot of large projects out there that are heavily relying on that, that I think have a long path to um, uh, production, I guess, and, 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 to, and certification. I think determinism and control is really something to focus on versus probability and, and, uh, and deep learning. Um, that's my, that's my, that's my, 10 seconds. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, Kathy? Okay, I'm going to go go away from my normal stance. I'm going to be optimistic today, and I'm going to say there are a lot of benefits that we can see today that, you know, the, the advanced driver safety systems that are, are available today that are the precursor to full automation have a lot of promise for for big improvements in safety if people use them responsibly and don't uh, don't uh, assume that they have more capability than they do. I like it, I like it, Mike. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I, I would say that, um, you know, I think we've been, uh, in marketing efforts, we've been told that, you know, automated vehicles will emerge on the scene and be able to operate safely 100% of the environments on their own. I think it's gonna take a cooperative approach where we're gonna have to have infrastructure and the data from infrastructure providers uh, being um, used by vehicles to operate safely, particularly in the near term. So I think it's gonna be a bit more of a collaboration and that's gonna take a little time. That's why we're all in it together. So already, I think we're a little over time. So I will hand it back to John, but thank you all so much for your time today. Um, it's, been, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie and panelists uh, for an engaging conversation that covered autonomous vehicle technologies, research, and how government is collaborating in Fairfax County and across the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now we're going to hear a case study on the first autonomous shuttle to operate on public roadways called Relay. Uh, walking us through the case study will be Etta 
Mahabedin uh, from Fairfax County DEI, Sarah Hussein from the Fairfax County Department of Transportation. Etta and Sarah, Sarah, take it away. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. Um, yes, so for, as, as I've mentioned for the past several years, um, Fairfax has been increasing our focus on growing the economy through, the, through innovation and, and emerging tech. And one of, the, one of the primary ways we've been doing it is through our partnership on Relay. This is a partnership between Dominion Energy and the Commonwealth of Virginia, many of the folks you heard from earlier on the panel, um, local universities. And um, in October, 2020, we launched um, this first autonomous public transportation demonstration project in, in Virginia. Um, so, you know, why did we launch uh, an autonomous vehicle in the middle of a bustling, bustling area with lots of people in cars? And what did we hope to learn? And where do we go from there? Some of it we covered in the previous, in the previous. But um, I'm Etta again, Naha Petian with the Department of Economic Initiatives, and I'm here with my colleague Sara Hussein from the Fairfax County Department of Transportation, and we'll kind of dig in a little bit. So next, so um, we're all, not only we're going to give you an overview of the project and why we decided to pursue it, but talk, we're going to dig in a little bit more on the use cases of where, what kind of residents and what kind of folks we think this technology can really, really help. And um, how can we turn some of the challenges that we, uh, that we have encountered, which is just part of the whole learning experience. What kind of opportunities do we see for us in the future and for you in the future and for the community and for the ecosystem as a whole? Next. So, so for, for, for the past several years, the way we kind of started this whole work is by starting to have a conversation with our leadership and with the community. Just needed to kind of learn what was going on in the innovation ecosystem as a whole. We had a series of symposiums, we had public events, we had hackathons, we had pitch, pitch events, pilot projects, and it was all kind of like we just wanted to understand like what are, what are the assets that we have? And we wanted the assets to talk to each other and we wanted the assets to know what our challenges were to help us kind of solve them. Um, and as through that whole process, we really had, um, we had very strong commitment from the board in this work. You'll hear later from Supervisor Faust and there's a photo of him right there, um, who has been supportive of this project from and the innovation work from the very, very beginning. Um, so, as to move that, move that work forward uh, and to move that research, to grow that research base in Fairfax, the only real way to really do it is to just to do it. You got it. You have to do it. You have to, it's like, you have to work with the material. You know, just like when you're creating a sculpture, you have to be, you have to kind of manipulate the material before you can really understand and create something from it. And so this pilot project, all the pilot projects kind of create a platform for us to, to interact with folks and for people to meet each other and for us to push things forward. Um, and Relay is, uh, and, and you know, Relay is not our only pilot project that we've done. You know, we, we did a pilot a few years ago with an Australian company that uses technology to, um, to determine a superior sub-base in road construction. We, we, I've talked to you a little bit about the bike ped challenge. We're working with a startup company out in LA on that. And like there are many companies who have pitched to us that are on our panels today. We're just trying to create a relationship with folks and um, create a stickiness among all of the ecosystem so we can push these things forward quickly and rapidly. And um, really, like I said, was one of the more challenging, uh, is our most challenging. Uh, there's There were a lot of regulatory challenges that we had to overcome both at the local, state and federal level you know, we had to go through the DMV and try to get an inspection for relay. And they're like, and we said, is it okay if the vehicle doesn't have a steering wheel? Can it pass inspection? And they're like, no. <laughs> so we, there's a lot of negotiation at every, at every single level. And um, there was legal issues we had to work through and cybersecurity issues and COVID threw a huge wrench in that when everyone, we have an international team that's been working on this and everybody was grounded there for a while. Um, but doing projects like this are just really, really important um, to really understand 
the, the, how, how, the, how the technology integrates with the infrastructure, how the technology integrates in this kind of a civic framework. And really the most overarching important thing that we want to kind of leave with you, I think, as far as why we're doing it is, is that it's, that it's about, that it's important that it's kind of addressing our, our transit and, and our mobility challenges. We don't want it to be just single occupancy vehicles on the road that have, um, you know, uh, turning around in circles, looking uh, instead of having this really kind of get more, less, less cars off the road. Um, next slide. So I just have to highlight just what a powerful partnership this is, and this is only possible through this group. And everyone has, has their own interests. And I think it's really, really important to understand that. Um, Dominion, uh, we connected with them almost at a chance, uh, almost at a chance in a chance encounter when they came to some of our um, events and we, we met and we, and we started talking and we determined that we both wanted the same thing. We wanted to have an autonomous vehicle pilot project, but we didn't have the funds to buy a vehicle and Dominion um, wanted to purchase a vehicle because their interest in the electrification of these vehicles in the future, but they had no place to put it except one of their campuses. So that has been a really fruitful and powerful mm -hmm. partnership. We've been working from day one with VDOT. You heard from Kathy McGee earlier from the Virginia Transportation Research Council. I mean, they they have a mandate from the state to regulate these vehicles. And they also have a mandate from the governor's office to grow AV tech as, as, as an important industry in, in Virginia. Um, and, we, and the Department of Rail Public Transportation, they provided the grant funding for us. And they... Um, they have a deep interest in this project, in, in this technology being a tool for transit. Um, we certainly have, and we've been working with Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. You heard from Mike Mullenauer and that have been doing, who are doing uh, all the technical research and independent study for this project. They provided infrastructure support all along the route. And we've also working with George Mason University who is doing the human factors research for us. And Edens uh, is the owner of Mosaic District. They are providing the storage location and they have an interest in, you know, are there more creative ways, that, uh, alternative options that they can have for their customers to come to the Mosaic District not using cars? And they're looking at this also as a placemaking tool and as a branding tool. So this is all to say that um, you know, we need these kind of partnerships to be able to build these kind of these. Um, to, to kind of build and move the technology forward. I mean, this is an ambitious project. There was no way of knowing when we started whether we were going to be successful. We created the road to relay from scratch. And what we think we've created a base to, to create even more ambitious innovation projects and partnerships in the future. So I'll hand it over to, to my colleague, Sara Hussein, to kind of dig in deep with, the, with some of the use cases. Thank you, Etta. Um, the Relay use case. So as mentioned, the idea behind Relay was to launch a real world pilot to explore a few areas. So some of these are um, to learn about and test AV technology. So there are a lot of AV deployments on campuses or closed loops with no other traffic. Um, Relay's route between the Mosaic District and Dunloring is complex and reflects where AV technology needs to be in order to be successful for a transit application. Um, we're exploring how Relay interacts with the built environment, as well as other road users uh, like drivers, cyclists, and pedestrians, and also how these other road users interact with Relay. We're also um, highlighting the importance of connectivity in Fairfax County. So the goal here was to create a first mile, last mile connection. Mosaic was selected in part because it's a vibrant population center that's about a mile away from a metro rail station. Um, we also wanted to take the opportunity to engage a variety of Fairfax County residents. So residents who don't usually take public transit, residents who can't take advantage of micromobility options that are becoming super popular now, uh, residents who live in areas that cannot be served effectively by your typical 40-foot transit bus, whether it's due to street limitations or a lack of operational efficiency. Another group is residents with accessibility needs. Some of the first interested parties were groups and individuals that work within the accessibility space. Um, one example is we, we held a community meeting on Relay for Mosaic residents. Uh, two women arrived early, super excited about the project. Um, they wanted to be first in line, they said. Um, one woman was visually impaired and the other woman's husband uses a wheelchair to get around. 
Um, so elements of relay that appealed to them were that the scale of the vehicle was comfortable for them, was more approachable. And then also the route alignment was more direct for their needs. So those are a couple of examples of the variety of residents we're trying to engage. Next slide, please. Um, some of the, so this is turning challenges and opportunities. So some of the challenges we've encountered along the way, um, technical issues and troubleshooting. So some issues that the team has worked through include um, sensor adjustment, GPS issues. Um, we've had to plan around vehicle software upgrades that require significant downtime. Um, a technical challenges also are not limited to just the vehicle. So we have transit signal prioritization installed on a few traffic lights in the corridor where relay crosses large intersections. So these um, the TSPs allow relay more time to, cr to cross those intersections. And um, we've had to troubleshoot some issues there. Uh, another challenge is infrastructure and environmental limitations. So our current deployment has a strict pre-programmed route to follow. We can't deviate from it unless we go into manual mode. Um, so there's limited flexibility there to detour around a special event or to serve a new destination. Everyday route conditions can cause some issues as well. So the vehicle sensors need a certain amount of clearance in all directions. And things that encroach within the clearance can cause um, slowdowns. So for example, we're not able to run in inclement weather, like heavy rain or snow. Um, vegetation growth on the route is another issue. So we um, regularly trim trees, bushes, and grass along the route. Um, double parked cars and trucks. So if a car is parked within that pre-planned route, relay has to go into manual mode so that the safety steward can navigate around that vehicle that's there. Another challenge is interactions with other road users, um, which uh, Mike mentioned earlier. So the max speed of relay is 10 miles per hour. Other drivers get impatient and they illegally pass. So the mitigation efforts we've put in place so far on, um, on our side is signage on relay, signage on the route, and we're working closely with law enforcement for police presence in that corridor. Um, and of course, COVID-19 impacts. So public transportation ridership has taken a nosedive and ridership, especially on Metro Rail, has not really recovered um, and of course, one of the anchors on our current route is Dunlore and Metro. It's important to note here though, that these various challenges have come to light because of the real world environment where we're piloting relay. So we sought out these challenges through the pilot. Um, without these kind of real world tests, the opportunities would not present, pre present themselves. Um, so these challenges represent great areas of great opportunity that we've started to explore. So we're looking at extending the pilot phase in a few ways. Um, one is just extending the current pilot as is, as we recover from COVID-19 to give people the opportunity to ride if they have not yet been comfortable to do so. Um, we're investigating AVs with different capabilities. So maybe a vehicle that's capable of higher speeds, um, a different approach to sensors or software and programming, um, a vehicle that's compliant with federal motor vehicle safety standards for roadway operation, that sort of thing. Um, we're also exploring a route expansion to maybe serve other destinations in the area, such as Maryfield Health Center, Inova Fairfax, and the new Inova Center for Personalized Health Campus that's across Gallows Road. Um, we're also considering an on-demand service model to better serve potential pa passengers, as you'll hear in the next, you'll hear about in the next panel. Next slide, please. Relay is an exciting project and we're thrilled to share the progress on it. So if you're interested in learning more, this last slide has contact info for Etta and me. Um, and we also have the Relay website link here. Thank you very much. Back to you, John. So thank you, Sarah and Etta. Um, what an excellent example of public-private partnership and one that you can actually explore in real life this summer in Fairfax County. So now let's go to our poll question. Um, I'll give you approximately 30 seconds to answer. Um, there's gonna be three questions. Uh, um, actually one question, but three potential responses. How likely are you to adopt or utilize Relay if it were in your community? Likely, I always want to try the newest tech. Somewhat likely or not likely. I'm not an early adopter when it comes to tech. Give you a few seconds to respond, and then uh, we'll go over the answers and move on to the next panel. So it looks like uh, Etta and Sara gave a really convincing presentation because uh, um, 68 more than um, almost 90% of of respondents or actually more than 90% of respondents would be somewhat likely or likely to, um, to try it out um, if it was in their community. So moving on to the next panel, um, we're going to be having um, 
On-demand services for first and last mile connections will highlight how navigating the first mile, last mile is critical to the successful implementation of autonomous vehicle technology. I'm delighted to introduce Chris Roberts of the DC Autonomous Vehicle Association who will moderate the discussion. Chris? Thank you very much, John. And uh, yes, uh, the DC Autonomous Vehicle Association is dedicated to promoting the benefits of autonomous vehicles in the DC area. So I'm very happy to moderate this discussion and I will uh, introduce our panelists. First is Daryl Keaton, founder and president of Sensegrate. Next is Tiffany Dupinski, statewide transit planner, Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation. Kayvon Maniri, Senior Director of Operations at Curbflow, and Avishai Shoham, Vice President of Mobility Products at VIA. Um, so I'd like to start with Tiffany here, and I, I think we wanna start with just understanding what we mean by on-demand services for last mile and first mile connections. And um, why have these uh, concepts gained importance and attention in recent years? That being on-demand services, first and last mile connections compared to a fixed routes transit system. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so from DRPT's perspective, we have always been looking at the whole surface transportation system when it comes to public transportation. Um, but I do think it's important, one, to acknowledge the value that fixed route services had in terms of moving goods and people. So the quality service that Fairfax Connector here in the county provides. And then thinking about how that collaborates with some of these new um, on-demand services. So not just the first mile, last mile connection, but what we also are talking about with all these wonderful terms, microtransit, mobility on demand, mobility as a service, um, even in the realm of just thinking connected and IMA vehicles. Um, I think that there is a relationship that should be acknowledged a little bit about how when we're looking at these services, it's supposed to be complementary and that we want to build each other up in order to really improve um, access to transit, which is kind of the, the ultimate goal for this. So on-demand services, it really is something that has come up over the last three to five years. Um, when we as the state were working on our statewide integrated mobility plan, we found that with transit agencies, that there was a lot of interest just because of how dynamic and flexible the services can be to changing demographics within service areas, to changing needs. So, you know, we're not only talking about general service that is provided, but also thinking about paratransit, non-emergency medical transportation, those elements that definitely take into account what we'll see more about on-demand services. But at a core, it really is thinking about where are your resources, where are your funds currently, and thinking about how to maximize that. And sometimes when you're looking at um, these on-demand services, we're seeing a lot from our level addressing two major needs. Really, is it that first mile, last mile connection that we're mostly interested in um, right now for today's conversation about connecting to existing service, connecting to existing routes in order to expand the, um, the reach that people can have to transit. But then there's the other part that we also can consider was that under, underperforming fixed route services. Sometimes um, we may have a fixed route that may not have the performance metrics that they're looking for from the transit agency perspective. So that's where you can look at on-demand services to provide a complimentary service to help, especially during peak hours, for example, or if there is issues about congestion and movement and flow in a corridor. So I think in terms of, you know, why are we seeing it? It's just because um, we're seeing a lot more interest in public transportation in general. I think with uh, the last year and a half in terms of those who have been transit dependent, but also those who, who may have some hesitation about um, just owning a vehicle at this point or navigating it. I think there is an investment in thinking about on-demand service. I mean, there are people who uh, definitely have opted to go with the TNC route for Uber and Lyft to have their own singular vehicles. But I think that... Um, Ultimately, it really is just how flexible and dynamic, I'll just keep saying it, flexible and dynamic, you can look at with on-demand services in order to fit, um, do the right size fit for that transit agency. So I think that's kind of where the appeal is that we're seeing at our level. Thank you, Tiffany. And you know, one of the companies that uh, operates uh, what we might call microtransit or on-demand services in a number of cities and municipalities already uh, in the country is VIA. And so uh, Avishai, 
What are some of the lessons you've learned in deploying similar sort of on-demand services in other parts of the country? And I'm particularly interested to know uh, if you have any lessons learned from some of your autonomous pilot programs you've been integrating in some of your fleets. Of course. Thanks a lot. And as Tiffany mentioned, the idea of micro transit or on demand transit has to come at the municipality level from an overall overarching transportation view. And the way that starts is from the service scoping, from the, from the stage of service scoping, deciding what areas of micro transit service will operate, how many vehicles, what times of day, how should we flex number of vehicles throughout the day to meet the transit needs that are not uh, being met by other fixed line or can be enhanced. So service scoping, doing a great job of that from the start, simulating with, with a lot of tools what it will look like when that service exists. So that's one of the things. You can plan ahead and solve a lot of the problems you'll face down the road. The second one has to do with customer management. Fixed line buses have been are simple to use. They're great for, for our high capacity corridors. They're a fantastic uh, uh, tool in, in the backbone of public transit. And people have known how to use them for many, many years. On-demand transit is relatively new. Booking through an application or calling a line to get a, a ride. What happens when you need to recognize in the vehicle? What happens if you change your mind once you're in the vehicle? Man customer management and rider management throughout the life cycle of the ride and afterwards. What, how do you handle lost and founds? All these issues have to be worked out in advance through both technology and product, but also operational processes. And so scoping this the service well and then solving the customer journey and their experience from the point they book until they get off the ride that is those are sort of the key components to focus on in the autonomous world via has deployed recently five autonomous vehicles as part of a public transit a deployment in Texas, where we have 70 human driven and five autonomous vehicles. And so we're really working on integrating the two together to get these learnings and compare them head to head. In autonomous vehicles, as where we are in the current technology life cycle has limitations. Where can the vehicles stop? What roads they can travel? How fast can they travel? How many passengers are really safe to board it at each point? And so working those pieces into both the planning and the customer life cycle are, are part of the challenges when you scope an autonomous service. One example is when there are no drivers in the vehicle, how does a customer change their mind and say, you know what, I don't want to go to my original destination. I want to get off at the next stop. How does, how does the customer interact with the vehicle at that level? So all these things have to be worked out. Thank you, Abishai. And that's very true that uh, with autonomous system, uh, customer service becomes far more complex and uh, technically demanding. Um, and in fact, you know, while an on-demand service, a potentially autonomous on-demand service brings more flexibility, obviously to the rider uh, and to the, to the transit planner, um, it's, we're talking about a, a, a more complex system. Um, and one of those complexities will be the curbside, which already is in high demand with food and parcel deliveries. Um, so what can be done to better manage the curbside in an on-demand service where there'll be more stops and stops in more places. So Kayvon, as Senior Director of Operations at Curbflow, what are the, some, of, some of the things you're working on to better prepare for a more autonomous future when the curbside's in even more demand? Uh, thanks, Chris. And, and you're totally right. Already today, we're seeing a lot more demand for the curb than there is supply. So you need to tackle both sides of that supply-demand imbalance. First on the demand side, you need to understand what the demand actually is. And that's actually a big challenge cities and counties are facing today. They don't have the data on what's happening at their curbs and where the parking and pickup uh, drop off demand is. Like when you think about it, a city or a county, they don't know UPS or DoorDash or Uber or Aramark or the thousands of other commercial operators, what their pickup and drop off locations are. So a lot of policy today is anecdotal and observational. So it starts with that robust data collection on the demand side. Once you understand how your streets and curbs are being used and by whom and when, you can start to do a couple different things on the supply side. One is you can better accommodate that demand, say by changing the rules of the curb. So you're seeing a lot of metered parking spaces and commercial corridors being switched over to pick up drop off zones, for example. Or you can even use flex zones where you flex by time of day. So that's one thing. Two is you can alter the demand itself. So you can price uh, the curve differently or de uh, demand responsibly. You can enforce it better, or you can incentivize usage at nearby curbs or parking spaces. 
Um, and to do all of that effectively, uh, technology is important. And that's where, where Curbflow comes in with a lot of cities. Um, what we primarily use with them is our computer vision technology. Um, this type of computer vision hardware is quite inexpensive to set up these days. Once you set it up at the high demand curbsides, you can do all of those things that I talked about. You can start collecting that robust data 24 seven. You can dynamically change the rules of the curb based on time of day, day of week, operator type. You can demand responsibly price in real time. You can enhance enforcement, do real time reservations and availability, those types of things. Um, so that's important today. And then as we look towards the autonomous vehicle future, it's gonna become even more important because the AV operators have that uh, conundrum that Abishai just mentioned where, how can they legally and compliantly know where they can pull over for pickups and drop-offs? So that curbside infrastructure is gonna be very important in quote unquote, talking to the autonomous vehicle and telling them when and where they can legally park or pull over and also where they should, where's the best available curb space near their destination. Thank you. And, you know, Avishai, um, how, how does VIA manage uh, pickups and drop-offs? Do you, are you, are you, do you pick up someone exactly where they are, or are you giving them instructions about uh, the safest place to, to meet the vehicle? So every deployment is different, primarily driven by the regulatory, the local regulations. There are some places that you can't stop at bus stops. There's some places you can only stop at bus stops if it's public transportation. And so our whole focus is how do we get the passenger to the pickup spot exactly at the right spot 30 seconds before the vehicle arrives? And we put a tremendous amount of effort around the data to make sure that handshake and timing is accurate. But in the world of autonomous vehicles, there, it can, there, there's always the event that, that someone else has stopped at the curb. How do you communicate to the passenger the new updated location that may be 20, 20 feet down the road? How do you communicate that it's, which vehicle it is? All of that has to go into the, the simple handoff. And so we do a lot of work both with, uh, with our, our, our municipal partners and our operations partners to mark the safest locations in every area and guide the passengers to the one that's most available and optimized. Thank you. And, um, you know, I guess what we've been talking about so far has been um, better understanding and, and coming to the realization that there's going to be, a, we need to understand a lot more data and be collecting a lot more data on what's going on in our streets um, for an on-demand service potential, especially an autonomous one. So Daryl, um, what is your vision for the type of data that we need to collect um, to better prepare and understand uh, how to manage our streets in an autonomous future? And also, what's the type of data you think future transit planners need to be using uh, to work with companies like VIA to map out exactly how some of these um, programs should uh, be deployed? Sure, thank you, Chris. Uh, I'll first touch, uh, touch upon the types of data that we should be collecting and using. Um, so there's two significant data points that are needed, um, traffic flow, analyzing congestion, and safety for all users on the roads and transportation infrastructure. Um, the traffic flow allows you to plan effectively for first and last mile automation. Uh, you want to sync these solutions to understand patterns of traffic, people movement, demand, and where the most significant locations for pickup and drop off zones. Uh, next, safety. Uh, we have to start assessing near miss collisions, collisions, lane closures, especially with uh, smart work zones, uh, and identify the risk incidents involving all road users and sidewalk users. Um, as we start to build out and look into these first and last mile solutions, you really have to understand the whole ecosystem and the infrastructure, not just in one location, but around a corridor grid or citywide. Um, and from there, you're able to start getting important movement and behavior information of all users uh, obtained from tracking data. Uh, now, we can't assume that we need planning, uh, what we need for planning. We have to understand the data and apply a citizen-centric approach to these methods and solutions for tomorrow. Um, this also includes sensor fusion of all available transportation, transit, and mobility data. Um, the data can be used to plan for today, but also advance solutions through vehicle to everything communication, or what we're doing at Sensorgrate is targeting infrastructure to vehicle communications, where we identify risk from the infrastructure and send it to vehicles, pedestrians, buses, and other mobility users and autonomous solutions to help them in route planning and fostering a safer interaction in the environment that they're driving on or engaging in. 
uh, the data connected from the uh, uh, the data collected from the infrastructure is very important for the future of autonomous vehicles and a autonomous technology. Uh, we always say you can't have autonomous vehicles without smart infrastructure. Uh, so for your second question, what will what data will planners need to make decisions and manage a more autonomous future? Um, data needs to be real time, um, providing intelligent uh, uh, decision making through machine learning and predictive analytics. Uh, we hear all the time that cities have a lot of data, but there's not a lot of process of that data to help them make smarter decisions in real time. Um, so when you're talking about curbside management and having multiple forms of solutions on the roads, how do you start integrating that together? Um, so you need to integrate with uh, not just the traffic and roadway data, but also with mobility data from ride sharing, e-scooters, e-bikes, e-delivery, and on-demand on mobility and traffic data. Uh, and then in the next few years, you also have to start in considering the connected and autonomous vehicle data too. Um, however, it's not just about the data collection, but really the, the, the significance of the analytics and how you can help make intelligent decisions for businesses, government agencies, mobility and transportation uh, solution providers. Um, other data, uh, as have been mentioned on the phone call, is utilization of curbs, curbside, including parking, uh, design and planning for routes, uh, uh, road, road diets, for example, uh, and then also infrastructure planning and design, uh, not just for AVs, but also the infrastructure for electric vehicles. Um, and then with the, the curbside, you're also talking about, uh, which, was, which was mentioned earlier, uh, double parking and violations from traffic. Thank you. Um, I, I definitely agree that, you know, with a, an on-demand service, potentially, especially an autonomous one, the, the demand for uh, stitching together all kinds of data, and as you said, you know, even real-time data sounds like a, a huge undertaking. Um, Tiffany, you know, as a transit planner, um, I guess, you know, it, it would be exciting to be able to have access to all of these uh, data sets um, for analysis and particularly, you know, you know in real time. Um, so. What would you, when we're talking about an on-demand or a microtransit service, what would you look for as ways to measure success and what metrics should we be looking for to measure success of, a, of an on-demand service that would be deployed uh, in the future? So I think, first of all, I appreciate Daryl's comments about data. I think data is probably the hardest challenge for any transit planner in terms of data quality, data access, um, and then how much data really do you need? So for metrics, it is customizable. It really depends on what is the need you're addressing when it comes to this on-demand or microtransit service. Um, thinking about the service area that it really is operating in, it really is kind of hard to say what would be like a one-size-fits-all in terms of metrics. But I always look at it from um, kind of two components, which I think Avishai really talked about a little bit, was one, the customer experience. So really thinking about how does the service either um, ideally you want ridership to go up, but also if you're introducing an app, for example, do you want to, in, you know, how many people adopted that service or that, um, or use the service in general? So kind of the adoption rate. And then I also think about your standard transit performance metrics. So, you know, number of trips or maybe the in increase in a revenue miles. And then also overall average wait time or on-time performance. I think that's usually the number one thing in terms of performance or customer experience is how long did you wait versus how much are you anticipated? And that's a little bit going forward with metrics is that I think what I've seen more, which is a little bit more qualitative is just the education and outreach and how that's impacted public reception and adoption as well. So do you see people being okay if there's a better estimation of how long they need to wait for services or you know the cost associated with that on-demand or microtransit service? All right, well, thank you very much, Tiffany. And I guess I'll just end uh, with anyone who, is, anyone who wants to uh, go uh, answer my question here, but you know, what, are, what, do you, what do we all think are like the major benefits you'd look for in uh, Fairfax County uh, adopting a, an on-demand, potentially autonomous on-demand service in the future? What are the, what are the, what is the greatest benefit you think uh, comes from these types of services? Well, I'll say safety, as, as was mentioned earlier. I think that's that's first and foremost the biggest thing. Um, a secondary thing I'll say is a, a lower reliance on vehicle ownership if you live in urban or semi-urban areas. 
Um, there are a lot of positive externalities with reducing single occupancy vehicles on the road. And, and I'll say access. Access it, it lets you be a lot more flexible, let you distribute and cover a lot more area for people that have limited mobility. I think access to public transit, access to, to key locations would be my, my number one point. All right, then. Thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for uh, just talking with us this afternoon. Uh, and I'll hand it back over to John. Thank you, Chris and panelists for your insights on how technology is being utilized to bring collaboration in the first and last mile of trips and how local and state government is involved in making this vision work in an autonomous future. After two very interesting panel discussions and a case study, I am pleased to welcome Fairfax County Supervisor John Faust, who will be giving closing remarks. Supervisor Faust represents the Drainsville District that includes McLean, Great Falls, and the town of Herndon. He chairs the board's Economic Advisory Commission and is a champion of developing innovative technologies in Fairfax County. Thank you for being with us this afternoon, Su Supervisor Faust. Thank you, John. Uh, it's really great to be here this afternoon. As we all know, Fairfax County has a uh, strong local economy and that has allowed county residents to enjoy a high quality of life. Uh, this has been accomplished through our focus on economic development. However, uh, as we highlight in the county's strategic plan for economic success, we know that no community has a preordained right to prosperity. We believe prosperity can only be achieved and sustained when a community's citizens, businesses, and government work in concert for everyone's benefit. So programs like this one with its focus on opportunities uh, to utilize creative, innovative technologies are exactly what is needed to ensure uh, the continued economic success of our county. Uh, there's a major theme in the county strategic uh, plan for economic success and that's innovation. We totally believe that Fairfax County's future economic success will depend on how uh, we as a county and more broadly as a region attract innovative technologies uh, as part of our strategic plan to grow the diversity the, and diversify the uh, economy of the county. Fairfax encourages innovation and testing of smart technologies to help expand existing business sectors, spark new business growth, nurture the innovative uh, the innovation ecosystem, and strengthen partnerships with technology experts, researchers, educations, educators, institutions, and policymakers. So as evidenced by today's discussion, attracting the innovative autonomous vehicle industry is a very important goal of the county. As has been discussed in October 2020, the county launched the autonomous electric uh, sh uh, shuttle pilot. It, I think it's very important to emphasize the partnerships that were involved. Uh, the, it was made possible by a $200,000 grant to the county from the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation. We're very grateful. Uh, the Board of Supervisors also approved a contribution of $50,000 from the county's Economic Opportunity Reserve. And we very much appreciate uh, that the demonstration project was undertaken in partnership with Dominion Energy. With respect to our goal to have an economy that is a leader in innovative technologies, the project was the first state-funded autonomous public transportation project in Virginia, as well as one of the first uh, tests of driverless technology uh, in public transportation in the state. So we believe this project helps put Fairfax County at the forefront of innovation by testing the smart technology for economic and environmental benefits, operational efficiencies, and as was discussed, as a first and last mile travel option, connecting people from metro rail stations to employment, activity centers, and residential communities. We definitely believe this innovative technology can be an important part of a successful economic future for the county and we are now seeking additional grant opportunities
to expand the program. So finally, I very much appreciate all the work that went into pre, uh, presenting today's program. Uh, what we heard today from the various panelists was exciting, and I believe it bodes well for the future of Fairfax County. I particularly want to thank Etta Nahapetian, who is a manager of smart growth or smart community innovation and strategy uh, in, a, in the county's Department of Economic Initiatives, as well as the staff of the Economic Development Authority, uh, which is a longstanding valuable partner for the county on economic initiatives for planning today's event. Fairfax County, uh, it needs to be said uh, when we talk economic development, Fairfax County is very fortunate to have the leadership and staff of the EDA working every day, create and expand the county's innovative innovation ecosystem and to ensure that our future economic, uh, our economic future is bright. And to all the panelists, thank you for your opinions, suggestions and insights. We hope that you will continue to work with Fairfax County uh, as we want to work with you to ensure the development of a very creative, innovative uh, ecosystem that will uh, lead to much success for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks, Supervisor Faust, uh, and for your leadership in, in uh, helping with uh, economic resiliency and innovation in Fairfax County. Um, we appreciate your leadership and you attending and uh, those remarks this afternoon. I'd like to wrap, wrap up this event by also thanking our panelists, speakers and partners for building the autonomous ecosystem in Fairfax County and Virginia. For all questions we were unable to answer due to limited time, we will follow up directly via email. For more information about the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority and the numerous services we provide, please visit our website for those of you who would like to contact me directly, my contact information is included. Good afternoon. If I didn't have second story in my life, I would for sure be homeless. I felt nervous about my abusive dad, so he would get angry out of nowhere. His mood swings were violent, and he would just beat us whenever he felt like he should. My best friend at the time was looking through programs for me because I was basically sobbing to her almost every day saying I can't afford to live on my own, I can't do this, I don't know how I'm going to survive and she found Second Story online and I got into the program. It was such an amazing relief. It was a huge burden that lifted off of my shoulders. When it comes to anything that's a necessity then Second Story will help me out. So when we found out I was pregnant, um, I got kicked out. Well, I originally got kicked out of my mom's house, and then that's when we became homeless. And so that's when we went to a shelter and all that. It was getting closer to my due date, so it was around September. So I called Angel, and I was letting her know, like, I don't want to have my baby at the shelter, because, like, it's, like, a community shelter, so there's, like, single guys there, single women there, you know, all together, and I didn't want that for my child. So I let her know, like, my situation, and then she, next thing I know, is in this program. <laughs> and once I got in here and I met Dominique and I met Angel and I could see they're actually willing to help and they really want to help, I was, my whole mindset changed. I've learned ways to be a mom and how to save and how to budget. Like, I never thought about budgeting ever in my life. So while I was in this program, I saved a lot of money more than I've ever saved in my life. Here at the shelter, um, we have wonderful staff, wonderful counselors here um, where we provide the individual counseling. Um, we do group coaching and family counseling sessions. Um, so we kind of provide a goal for them to work on while they're here. Um, the expectation is to reach that goal. Um, so in any way 
that we could help. You know, we try to come from different ends and different, um, do different tactics and strategies to help these kids and families so that they can reach that goal when they complete the program. The shelter is a place where uh, the teen can come and, and get uh, have a supportive environment and the parent or guardian can get a little space and, and they can have a, a moment to catch their breath and have a plan for the, the teen going back home. In some cases, teens are here because they have much more uh, severe situations at home. Because a lot of the kids, you know, they definitely have traumatic um, experiences that they go through, whether it's, you know, um, you know, they've been abused sexually, physically, um, and parents don't understand why kids act out, you know, in that sense. Um, and so, you know, with the family counseling sessions, you know, we kind of um, provide tools for them um, to get the help that the kids need. To see teens who are working to overcome those life circumstances and, and get the support uh, to take take steps in, in a direction that helps them build their life uh, is an inc you know an incredible thing to see in action and it's it's really rewarding because they leave you know they leave our program they're excited they're happy um, and then when we do a follow up you know they're working um, and it's so like so so wonderful to hear that Something I think is special and unique about the Scene Center is the fact that is it is a, set, a safe environment for us to come and hang out with our friends, do homework, and we get extra help and there are resources we can use when we don't understand something we can ask. I am very interested in computer science, so I would want maybe to go work for a federal agency and do computer stuff there. The Teen Center helps me um, they investigate other programs to see what programs I would be interested in to, to help me pursue my dream of computer science. Hmm, I dream to be on an island. <laughs> Puerto Rico, my favorite. <laughs> oh, me, my husband, and my daughter in Puerto Rico. Maybe having two kids, and then I'd do something in nursing or the medical field. I hope to find ways to use renewable energy and base all of our transportation and a lot of our modern advances and basically transition them to renewable sources. Second story is a, a second chance. It really is. It really is a second chance. It's a new beginning. It's just a, it's a positive feeling. It's just great. I love it. <laughs> My kids were getting concerned that I um, wasn't the same that I was. And um, I didn't know exactly what they were talking about, but um, to make a long story short, um, my oldest son said that he wanted to take me to a doctor. There was something wrong, really wrong, wrong with mom. She, we found bills that she hadn't paid or she had double paid. Um, that's when we noticed that we felt that people were, who had called themselves her friend were taking advantage mm -hmm. of her. And, and I didn't think that my new wife, the prettiest woman in the room, would ever be sick. And um, it's here. So you just go with it. And I'm gonna to be totally honest. I burst out crying and I cried for two weeks and thought, what am I going to do? You know, what is my life going to be? I sensed that she was not as comfortable alone. And that's a point where things began to change. It isn't that she just comes in and, and doesn't see things. She's very aware of her surroundings and she knows that her limitations, but she does everything she can to fight. The neurologist told us that she needed a daycare. And I googled daycare. I googled adult daycare. I googled adult daycare Alzheimer's and you all popped up. And before I came to visit you, I had been to several other facilities. But when I walked into your place, into Insight Memory Care, I knew immediately that was the right place. And it's gonna be interesting because it's because of the sunlight 
Okay, I know that sounds strange, but the sunlight pouring through the windows made a difference. Maybe it's a metaphor, but it felt like home for her. I knew she would be comfortable. I knew it, and it was an instant decision. The transition to convince your wife to go to daycare, um, it's not an easy one. Just the mental concept of putting your own spouse in a daycare. It's emotional. So you get over that hurdle. So you go to pick up that spouse at daycare. And they come out and they said, I'm not going back again. Okay, hon, that's fine. You know, we'll, we'll see how tomorrow goes. So the weather's not that super tomorrow. I'm not going. Okay, fine. We'll just stay home. So let's try it the next day. So she tried it the next day. So after about a week and a half, two weeks, she really got into the routine. And that's when she started to get up get ready and come out. When you love someone and you see them suffer and you don't understand what's wrong with them and you don't understand how to help them, when you find the right strategy that helps them, it just does so much for your peace of mind and for your quality of life. When mom is happy, I'm happy. And that's what Insight has done for us. This is a place, even though she's dealing with traumatic events and thoughts, this is where she can come and have someone hold her hand and say, I know what you're going through. We found that Pat is so much happier when she has a structure, when she knows what she's going to do each day. She can get up and she sometimes gets ready before I do, has her coffee made in her, in her to-go cups and um, brings, you know, brings two to-go cups for the ride down and is very happy to, to come in and, and see your friends. We have um, men and women and, and we have fun and have meals together and something and it's like, it's like a, it's a nice group and we get to know each other and it kind of keeps us leveled out and enjoying each other and having lots of laughs and I love it. I love it. <laughs> as soon as I drive up, someone has been watching and they come out and they say, oh, no matter who it is, hello Mary, how are you? I'm so happy to see you. Let's go. I love you. And she says, I love you too. And she lights up. It's incredible. She does. And she and never looks back. She just gets out the car. Too. She, she gets, never looks back. She's like, you know, like, it's like okay. this five-year-old going <laughs> off to kindergarten. You're like, but, but Ma, you're, yeah. What, what, you're not going to say, but, okay. Fine. And she's gone. Um, yeah. The fact that Inside has so many good programs, there's so much going on here, so many um, advantages for her to be here, that over time I could see a change in her personality. Patty pointed to a picture in the art room and said, I did that picture. And I said, you've never done art at home. She said, well, yeah. So we have about six, seven pictures at home that she's done. And, and she enjoys the watercolor uh, and, uh, and likes that. So I ask her some days, have you done the art? And she won't remember, but then a couple of days later, here comes the picture, so. But it's just, it's, she really feels like she can accomplish something. She said, she used to say all the time, when is this going to end? I'll be so glad when this ends. Do you know when this is going to end? When will I get better? When will I get better? Uh, she doesn't say that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, she's happy now. I can see that this is a home away from home for her. A really safe sanctuary with people who love her and, and um, that she trusts. We know our loved ones and we know the idiosyncrasies and we know what they like and what they don't like and we even remember how they were and we know how they are today. But Insight has the knowledge and the experience of Alzheimer's and I personally believe that the knowledge and the experience that you have of Alzheimer's trumps what we know about our loved one. There's an old expression that says, people don't care 
what you know until they know that you care. And that's what we sense here.